Hey, how are you? How's it going? I'm good, how are you? I'm great. I feel like I didn't oh. just talk to you two seconds ago. Let's pretend. Let's pretend. <laughs> how's how's it been going? Um, hi guys, welcome to History of a Haunting. I'm Carrie. And I'm Laura. And I don't have any EVPs. That's a fucking shocker. It is, yeah. Kind of, to be honest. It is. Um, yeah, nothing. Got nothing. Right. Not a whole lot going on up here. That's cool, too. Really ever, frankly. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you want to just jump into it? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. We are going to... Laura, take it away. <laughs> the Carrington Psychiatric Hospital in New Zealand. Yay! And we're doing a lot of international locations. I love it. Me, too. Just giving me more places to want to go. Right. So my sources for today are wikipedia.org, terra.govt.nz, thespinoff.co.nz, and behance.net. Did I spell something wrong? You look like you no, have no, never no, heard no, of them. No, okay. no, 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 no. I was like okay. looking at something. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so you, um, I know that you did your research on this place, too. Did you come across, like... This place is, has like 20 fucking names. Yes. It, it actually confused me. I thought, did I get the name wrong? Did I? Yeah. Right. I did the same thing. I'm like, wait, did I just switch and now I'm doing research on the wrong location? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not. So. Oh, but this is a good be our yeah. little like puzzle piece uh, episode. Oh, yeah, 100%. Because cool. some other places came up when I like, you know, started Google searching and stuff these other names and I was like that's not what I even asked Google <laughs> I didn't even ask for that why are you being such a bitch right um, really Google <laughs> was being fine oh okay we were just confused yeah no we were cool. so uh, some of the names uh, that you will also find this under is whoa I did look this up it's spelled w-h-a-u and it's pronounced fo or whoa lunatic asylum Cool. Um, okay. The Auckland Lunatic Asylum, Avondale Lunatic Asylum, Avondale Hospital, Auckland Mental Health Hospital, Oakley Hospital, Carrington Psychiatric Hospital, commonly Carrington slash Oakley Hospital. All right. I think that's all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and now my list. <laughs> right, that's ridiculous. So um, this was a psychiatric hospital um, that was on the Oakley Farm Estate situated in Point Chevalier, Auckland. Cool. So it was built in 1865 on the Great North Road, um, and it was one of the largest asylums in the colony. Okay. At the time, it was a colony. Neat. So for the past 155 years, the imposing neoclassical building, once known as the Carrington Psychiatric Hospital and the Woe Lunatic Asylum, has scowled at the village of Point... Please don't say all the names again. <laughs> no, I'm not going to. <laughs> and at virtually everyone who has ever headed west along Great North Road. It's one of the city's architectural icons, and with its Italianate, Romanesque facade and sprawling wings, an enduring symbol of colonial grandeur. But it also serves as a reminder of the intolerance of the past. It's no secret just how crudely Victorian and early 20th century New Zealand society viewed the idea of mental health. And not oh. just New Zealand, pretty much everywhere. Pretty much everywhere, yes. Yeah. Yes. So stories abound of the dubious methods used to treat those with physical or psychological illnesses, those two, over the last 150 <laughs> years. Um, I like the shot. Therapy, lobotomies, mm. enforced institutionalization. Those with even mild conditions were removed from society and hidden like shameful stains, stains because they were they deviated from social norms. Yeah. It's not pretty anywhere in the world where these places are. And London London actually has some really fucked up ones. I believe that shit. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, in September of 1863, architectural plans by a Mr. Barrett from England were submitted to the Auckland architect James Wrigley, who adapted them. Uh, during construction, there was a brick shortage. I thought this was kind of funny. And so... Like, one guy was hired to get all the bricks, and he couldn't do it, so they ended up making some of them on site um, in order to complete the building. Weird, huh? That is kind of weird. A brick shortage. Yeah. Hmm. Strange. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, the facade is neoclassical and has polychromatic detailing. Um, like I said, it's built of brick and it's on the Great North Road leading to Mount Albert. Albert. Jesus. In the central portion of the building. <laughs> Mount the Albert house. Jesus? Wow. All right. <laughs> it's a special mountain. Um, <laughs> Bet you didn't know Jesus' his first name was Albert. <laughs> Nobody ever talks about that, do they? They don't. <laughs> Mm-mm. I think they should more. We are so um, going to hell. All the time. Um, so wait, in the center of the building were the dining halls, kitchen, and storerooms, and the two adjoining wings were the male and female wards. The male dining hall was also used for thea- theatrical and musical performances, and there were auxiliary wood buildings, but they were destroyed by fire in December of 1894. Okay. <laughs> um, fires keep coming up here a lot. Yeah, they uh, sure do. They sure do. Yeah. I, I talk about one of them in my part. Yeah, me too. I'm going to get to the fun part of that. Um, so a new brick building was completed in 1886 to 1807. Uh, the Chapel of St. Luke the Physician was built in 1865. It was used as a dormitory for a while, but then was renovated and reopened as a chapel in 1961. Well, okay. Yeah. There is a spring on the estate um, with a waterfall on Oakley Creek. That sounds beautiful. Yeah. Are you about to tell me something horrible happened in the spring? No, not yet. Uh. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And that waterfall um, had ample water for domestic and fire prevention purposes. Okay. Comes up later. (laughs) A farm (laughs) consisting of nearly 200 acres was attached to the asylum providing for healthful recreation and fresh vegetables. There were approximately 50 milk cows on the estate and a large number of pigs, meaning they had a piggery. Yay, I love a good piggery. (laughs) I I saw that and I was like, she's going to be so excited. I'm so happy. I love a good piggery. (laughs) Who doesn't? So an unlimited supply of fresh eggs were obtained from the farm's poultry and part of the land was turned into an experimental sewage farm. Not so fun. (laughs) <laughs> your face says it all. And so in the late 1800s, um, committed patients averaged about 500 in number, with an estimated average of eight deaths per year. Okay. Um, there were only about 52 staff for that amount of patients. Oh, I was like, that sounds right? manageable. Never mind. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> if they all work all the time. Yeah. Um, Which they probably did. Right. The asylum was gutted by fire twice on the 20th of September, 1877. The first of two major fires occurred. The first and worst was set by a patient and resulted in one female inmate being burned to death. The charred remains of a patient were recovered among the ashes of the dilapidated building. (laughs) The woman responsible gave evidence to police and reporters about her role in lighting it. It was believed that Mrs. Fortune I'm not making that fucking name up, had instigated the fire after gaining access to a box of matches during a visit from friends earlier that afternoon. Nice. Yeah, not good friends. Mm -mm. The spread of the fire remained mysterious, though, and reports show officials could find nothing to indicate why that abundant water supply from Oakley Creek had failed on the night of the fire. Accusations were made that the city council had turned the water off. Oh. Yeah. So kind of funky. Um, Additional deaths ensued among both patients and staff in the subsequent years, and it is estimated that hundreds of people died on the site during its 130 years of operation as a mental institute. In 1922 alone, 60 patients are believed to have fatally contracted typhoid. Oh, God. Yeah, not great. The, The deaths were allegedly not made public because they related to the poor sanitation at the hospital due to the use of dirty water wells. Other peculiar deaths. Um, the spring sounds like it's not doing its job. No, and the experimental sewage farm, like, maybe not a great idea. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, but poor pigs. Yeah. Anytime you say experimental sewage farm, I'm like, mm, no, thank you. Of all the things to experiment with. Right. No. Why? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> um, there was a warden who was pitchforked to death by... Did you say pitchforked yes so pit with a he was murdered with a pitchfork he stuck it in him god um, damn and killed the guard instantly 
Um, another peculiar um, death was the blundered suicide of Thomas Meredith and the suicide of Thomas Lynch. So I'm going to tell the story of Thomas Meredith. Um, okay. He was a patient um, and 35 years old. Um, on the 5th of November of 1897, he slipped away while he was working in the asylum's garden. Um, and a search was organized and they continued throughout the afternoon, but they couldn't find him. So a report was made to the police and then they just kind of let it go. Sure. So Meredith had been reported to be cheerful the night before, um, playing cards with a guard. And, you know, they didn't think he was going to, that it seemed like he was going to do anything on tour ward is what the <laughs> article said. Um, a week later, though, Meredith's relatives learned that he was missing only from indirect reports that the police were making inquiries. Um, a cousin of his went to the Auckland police station to find out what was happening. Um, and then went to the Avondale police station, which is the closest one to the asylum. The constable there was unaware that anyone was missing from the asylum. Although he'd heard a rumor of a strange man being seen in the district. What? Yeah. So a search was then undertaken through the Western districts from Avondale to Henderson, following these rumors of a man acting oddly seen at various times by the local residents. Um, in what was still um, a thinly populated area. Okay. So this, it turned out to be a red herring, um, but the trail led to Horatia Bridge on the 16th of November and the drowned body of John Halstead, an inmate from the Costly home in Greenland. Um, Halstead had coincidentally escaped from Costly around the same time as Meredith disappeared from the asylum. And they thought it was Meredith until they could figure out it was the other guy. So then, right, it's just a clusterfuck of mistakes. So then, finally, on November 20th, Meredith's body was found hanging by his own belt from the limb of a willow tree near the asylum grounds. Oh, my God. He even gone very far. And sadly, two boys um, found him. And he had been, he's in an advanced state of decomposition, identifiable only by the clothing. So I actually the think Auckland, there was an episode of Bones about that. Oh, maybe. Someone, the Auckland Star, said direly in their headlines, has blundered. <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, yeah, that's just a whole mess of negligence. It is, really. And incompetence. Mm -hmm. And if they searched all afternoon, where were they searching? In the right. experimental sewage plot? Right? He's not in the piggery. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> can't find him. Pigs haven't seen him either. All right, we're out. Yeah. Um, very strange. Uh, in more recent times, the 1982 death of Michael Watting, following the administration of electroconvulsive treatment. In a subsequent inquiry, um, ECT procedures at the hospital were labeled alarming deficient at the time of his death. Watine received the ECT on a mattress on the floor of a small strong room. After the death, the inquiry ordered changes to the way ECT was administered and said an anesthesiist, I say that right, should mm, remain in the room until a patient recovered fully. It's an ist. Huh. Anesthetist? Anesthesia. Anesthesia. I want to say anesthesiologist, but that's not what That's what I want to say, too. Yeah. An anesthesiast. Um, no. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Listeners, feel free to fight in with that. Right. They're like, um, who cares? Get on with it. We know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> the institutionalization of care from the 80s led to the closure of the hospital. And in the early 1990s, the building was taken over by Carrington Polytechnic, hmm. later Unitech. Um, and it remains that to this day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, while I was researching this, I came across um, a book on the Behance.net that was created from by a student for their degree um, while they're studying at that university, that's that it is now, um, on the asylum. Um, and the book is by Corinne Lochner. Um, it was never published, but she used it um, as her project for her degree. So um, in it, there's a really, there's case studies of the earlier patients. So I'm going to oh, okay. run down of, I'm not going to name them, but. All 500 patients that were there. Yes, yeah, so one of the <laughs> patients that was actually there. Oh, okay. So 
This is a female um, Maori. Um, they had them numbered, so she's number 17. Ew. She was 40 years old. Okay. Her mental disease was acute mania. Mm. Um, the duration of attack was five days. The number of previous attacks were 11. Um, she was admitted on the 20th of February, 1905, and her married occupation is listed as house duties. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, yeah. So the medical cert by the doctor said that she was shouting and throws herself about. The interpreter, um, Liedem Whitehead, said she was shouting prayers and swearing and is talking a lot of nonsense. Are these the attacks that it was talking mm-hmm. about? The attacks lasted yeah. five days? This okay. was her behavior, like how she got institutionalized. Good Lord. So the constable said that on Saturday she made a disturbance on the wharf. She was very violent and assaulted several people for no reason. She is very noisy and has not slept. She was rambling and incoherent, sometimes swearing and praying. She will not take her food. Uh, Mrs. McDonald, the matron, said she has been shouting all night. The husband said that they didn't have any relatives, that she was subject to nervous or chest disease. Her grandmother was also insane. Um, Her memory was good um, and she was energetic, never had injuries to her head or sunstroke or um, anything medical like that. Sure, Um, that would have caused something like this. Right. Okay. So she had one child who died when the child was 12. Cause of insanity unknown. Um, She was in the Auckland Asylum from June 30th, 1904 till um, February 16th, 1905. And then it looks like she was (laughs) reappointed like five days later. She was what? She was in there before and then it looks like she was readmitted. Um, so her height is five foot four. Her weight, I think this is funny. Medium sized woman in very stout bodily condition. Head medium sized. <laughs> and she died January 10th, 1907 at 6 p.m. Um, she had pithesis pulmonalis, which is, um. Very hard to say. Oh. Yes, very oh. hard to say. And also tuberculosis. Oh, is that the actual medical? So they, whatever. I mean. That's awful. Yeah, that's awful. It really, yeah. And there's, I mean, it's just interesting to actually see, like, why these people were put in and kind of what what happened. Right. Um, And, like, how they were, like, written about or whatever. And mm -hmm. Yeah, very. Somebody says that I have a stout bodily figure. I'm going, probably going to rant at them and (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna be shouting as well i will be shouting too (laughs) right um there wasn't also in this book uh, an interview with um, a nurse that worked there um Mm. named hilda weavers um and i'm just gonna read an excerpt out of it um and the question is when did you start at carrington she said, I started on the 19th March in 1959. I worked as a psychiatric assistant for six months. When I started, I got five pounds a year extra for doing my training and five pounds for being over 21. Okay. So the stories that send out to you escapes or any mischievous patients. Um, she said the hospital was locked and we used to have to, we used to have the occasional escapes and the staff used to go out and look for them. Eventually, if they couldn't find them, the police were informed. Not like it is now where the police have to be informed. These people were unsuitably medicated, not like the modern medications where it is individualized and the medication is not as broad spectrum. Um, Okay. So they were just kind of trying whatever to see what worked, I'm guessing? They were basically just to date them. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. And she says that they really didn't know very much about the medication. They were just told to give it to them. Oh, Um, (laughs) shit. I'm going to kind of paraphrase here. Um, we kind of made this the from the effects. experimental sewage plant. So here, try right. this. Yeah, you're going to enjoy this. Um, they didn't know what the side effects were. Um, the training was n- not up to standards of what sure. anything um, like it was like it is now. Um, so she said, nevertheless, despite people who are still actively psychotic, they used to act out um, on their symptoms. And there used to be quite a few scuffles. <laughs> there was not the staff at the time and they there was not like enough staff at the time and they never took it personally it was just a matter of taking them through usually half a dozen staff to a side room no one was hurt and i think no matter what the staff 
never ever took it out on the patient. In fact, I can remember one patient well, marching around the day, right? Room, arms folded, march, 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 went around all day, walk, 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 and then out went a punch. And I was going out that night and it gave me a black eye. <laughs> <gasps> um, I went out just about every night and that was fine. And I got better. And then a week later, she did it again to the other eye. <laughs> she said she'd just laugh about it. It was just one of those things that happened part of the job. Oh my God. You really have to be a special kind of person to to work in an environment like that. 100% and not to get upset. Not to get um, upset, but to just have even more empathy for the people that you're charged with taking care of. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she started back in the 15, 50, 50s. Yeah. So, yeah. As we know, not so great for the time but i mm -mm. thought that was interesting her just talking about how she got black eyes just so chill yeah and then the real thing of how it was yeah. going on you know like right they didn't know what the hell they were doing either you know it sounds like yeah very no over no real oversight or anything mm -mm. it doesn't it's sound like to chill you out and then you know yeah if this doesn't work luck. well then we're gonna have to lobotomize you for real <laughs> on a mattress on a floor even though that was right. electroconvulsive still god uh-huh electric basically electric shock there mm -hmm. but that is my tale of the history of the carrington psychiatric hospital we'll stick with that one <laughs> yeah we'll just stick if it's on the title card and that's just right. we'll it. go with that one okay. uh great job wow that was that was really interesting um i say yay for the piggery and boo for the sewage ex experiments or whatever. What did it say? What the sewage experiment was? That's all they said. I'm assuming it probably had to do with the runoff because they had so many cows and pigs. Sure. That it was probably something to do with that. It all mm. has to go somewhere. Maybe they were trying to use it for fertilizer or some. Thing. Well, if they had bad runoff and it went into the the water that they're using to drink and shit the spring That's, mm -hmm. that seems like a real waste of time that spring <laughs> right. why is that even there just for looks at this point um great job yeah i had yeah i had no idea i had come across this on you know on one of my favorite you know most haunted lists and i thought you know what we have never done a new zealand location i don't believe Monte Cristo Homestead, I believe, is in Australia, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, we did that one a while ago, so forgive me if I don't remember correctly. Um, I'm sure they'll tell us. Uh, <laughs> so um, my part, I don't have a whole lot. Um, it is difficult to find anybody because, like you said, it is, it's a school now. And um, it is difficult to find anybody that's had experiences. And they don't actually let a whole lot of paranormal groups in there to investigate, obviously, because it is a school. So um, I got my, my information. Oh, I should probably push my little button here. I got all my information from just one source, and that's hauntedauckland.com. So everybody, don't look at my messed up shelves. Um, <laughs> my shelves that need organizing. Um, so... Like you said, um, you know, the in the late 1800s, committed patients um, averaged at most what this p page said at the at its peak was 900 mm -hmm. patients. Um, yeah, it, the asylum was gutted by fire twice, um, and it, it, the death that had happened there, um, you know, the the. Additional deaths that ensued among both patients and staff in the subsequent years. Um, it's estimated that hundreds of people died on the site in its 130 years of operation, um, like you had mentioned. Um, so the deaths were allegedly not made public because they related to poor sanitation at the hospital due to the use of dirty water wells. Um, so when asked about the hauntings at this location the one of the unitech security guards 
put the ghost rumors down to folklore, urban legends passed down from one student to another. They say eerie noises are a result of air entering joints of old windows and creaking and banging is caused by old iron heating systems. They say there is a logical explanation for every peculiar noise. However, they do understand that it is common for people to believe that because it was an institute that incarcerated people, the spirituality of some patients remain. Which I was like, hmm, okay. Um, so really, I, I, I just came across a pretty comprehensive list of all of the different activity that has been reported there and a couple of accounts from students there at the school now. Um, throughout the years, there have been many reports of unusual activity within Building 1 and Building 76. So I don't know if there actually are more than, like, there actually are at least 76 buildings on this <laughs> property, um, or if that was just whatever number it was given at the time. Um, so shadows are often seen moving around rooms and down hallways, glimpses of people through the glass portion of a locked door. Upon entering the room, the room is empty. Uh, voices are heard when no one is around, their lights flicker. That's easily explainable, though, I would imagine. Um, the sound of keys clanging. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> At one point, a large paintbrush was thrown across a room. So maybe this marching, fit-throwing person was just mad at whatever was going on. Um, a mug flew across the room and broke in the old chapel. Uh, books have been thrown off shelves. An apparition of a ghostly woman wearing a black and white nurse's uniform has been seen frequently. Um, students and tutors are commonly pushed on the stairs. Mm -mm. Number one, don't push me. Two, not down the stairs. I can, I do well enough to just walk down them fine by myself. Please don't push right. me on the stairs, dear God. <laughs> I don't need any help falling down, trust me. No, I really don't. Um, sensations of being slapped. Uh, music is often heard playing when nobody's in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, a woman has been heard screaming in one of the bathrooms in the West Wing. Uh, doors are heard or seen slamming by themselves. And then a, a number of stories of footsteps heard down the corridors. Um, the other things that have been, have been um, reported at Carrington Psychiatric Hospital are various items seen moving or falling without reason, radios changing stations on their own, the feeling of being watched, feelings of nausea, headaches, and unease in certain areas, again, lights going on and off, machines turning on by themselves, that's a little fucking scary, Mm -hmm. um, curtains moving with no windows opening, or no windows open, rather, and this I thought was the worst one, scratching sounds heard at the windows. That would scare the hell out of me to hear somebody scratching on a window. Um, 100%. Yeah, I don't love it. So I was was really impressed with the amount of like actual like claims that have been made and how mm -hmm. how detailed the list it was. Um, so a, a few personal accounts. Like I said, I don't have a whole lot. Um, but a man named Jay said, I myself had an experience in Building 76 when I studied there in the early 2000s. I was there around 2 a.m. Yes, I used to work late. I was just leaving and I saw what I would describe as a very strong glowing ball that swayed as it moved down the corridor. Um, it was, I guess, slightly higher than waist height. I don't think it was a security guard with a torch because there was no beam to the light and they didn't call out or say anything. Plus there were no other vehicles in the car park. Oh. Right? A glowing ball of light. Ooh. I mean, it sounds pretty, but at the same time, I'm going to be like, what are you? Do I want to know what you are? <laughs> Um, a girl named Cassidy wrote in and said, I never believed in any ghost stuff, but Unitech has definitely got some shit going on. <laughs> our, <d> our dark room, which is in the basement, is pretty active with things, and I always find it's a horrible place. Radios always go static, make noises, and always banging. Radios are banging? That's like... Hmm. hmm. Unless it sounds like there's banging coming through the radio? Maybe. Maybe. Um, I've heard people in there when it's completely empty. I never go down there by myself because something always ends up happening. Um, another common thing that happens in this building is high EMF readings. 
Now, a paranormal group was allowed to do an investigation there, and this is what they wrote of their findings of the EMF um, detectors. I really, I really enjoyed it because because it is a school, because there is, you know, it is an open and operating building, obviously, when there are no classes, but there's still electricity running through that entire building, right? So mm-hmm. I kind of took this with a grain of salt, but I was pretty impressed with some of the stuff that they had, you know, that they had debunked or, or whatever. Um, the report said during the second investigation, the main activity we experienced during the night were unusually high EMF levels. The teams were picking up unusual electromagnetic field readings in various places throughout the building. What made these even more interesting was that they seemed to move, appearing in one spot, then within seconds, moving a few feet away. Whether this was in fact a natural occurrence or typical building energy field, we were unsure. However, surely if the energy emissions were documenting, we were documenting were fields caused by wiring, internal electrics, electrics, etc., surely they would be stable and static and not move around. Which I was like, okay. Good point. Good point. Yes. That's fair, <laughs> fair. I like it. Um, they concluded by saying the size of the fields were interesting also. Most we detected measuring only a few feet in circumference. So it's not very big space that right. they were getting these spikes in. Um, so that's kind of it. That's, that's what I have on Carrington Psychiatric Hospital. There wasn't a whole lot about the hauntings of it. Um, most of what I found was the school and what it used to be, all the different names and, and things like that. But um, it sounds like a really great, great place as far as paranormally it, it goes. Um, it was definitely worth having its story told. I think, I think all of these locations deserve to have their story told, especially, you know, former mental institutions or lunatic asylums or whatever you want to call them, whatever they were called back in the day. Um, so I was like, you know what, let's do this one because you know, we don't do a, a whole lot internationally. And, you know, mm-hmm. what was what was mental health, uh, mental institutions, what were they like in other parts of the world? And come to find out, they were the exact same. They also fucking suck. Yeah. yeah. There's that. There's that. They just suck no matter where you go. So, yeah, that's it, guys. That's, that's what I have. That was great. Thanks. I did enjoy the history of mm-hmm. it, I have to say. There's a yeah. lot that went on there. So Yay, I, I piggery. Could, I could definitely see. Plus, you have the water. You know, we got water there. We got mm-hmm. water there so. Yeah, and you know, you have to know that, you know, these, the people, the patients that were there, you know, they were um, mentally, emotionally, physically tortured. So that's going to leave an imprint on a building. Mm-hmm. Emotional. Um uh, lots of death. Lots of death, lots of emotional trauma. Um, you know, souls can, can leave imprints on, on buildings when they're, you know, beaten and battered. And uh, sounds like this place has got all kinds of activity and, and no, no short supply of it. So I like it. I think it's a good one. This is a good one. I think so, too. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yay. All right. Well, as always, guys, you know where you can follow us. But Laura, tell them anyway. Happy to. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at H-O-A-H, H-O-A-H podcast. Are you sure? I'd know it by now. Right. I mean, it's written right there. <laughs> I mean, whatever. <laughs> you can also find us on TikTok at H-O-A-H podcast, at H-O-A-H Carrie, and at H-O-A-H co-host Laura. Yay. Woo. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. That was it for um, this week's episode. Laura and I are just cranking out the episodes this week because she's on vacation and then I'm on vacation. And so we are just stockpiling up the episodes so that we don't miss a week. Um, and we still bring you your We're content. You. We're working for you. We're working for you. Yeah, we are. So anyway, guys, thank you so much. As we always say at the end of every episode here at History of a Haunting, stay safe out there because you never know who or what is listening. Bye, guys. Bye. (laughs)